You ain't got enough sense to set up next to the poison hemlock. You ain't got enough sense for me to listen to. And I'd say it's an ingestion poisoning. So unless you see me eat this, comma, dumbass, comma, dumbass unless you see me eat this or try to extract it by making a tincture or something or a salve, I'm okay. So the reason my bug out bag can be so light is because I rely on a system of caches. And basically I think about everything that I could possibly need. And rather than carry it on my back, I pre-stage it in locations along my route and in alternate places that I just need to get to. And me getting to that place is facilitated by having less weight on my back. So a system of caches is one of the most crucial parts of my system other than having an alternate bug-in location that's stocked as well. And there are a number of different containers that you can use. You just need to think about, you know, something that's durable and something that's waterproof. And of course, so that I can lay this stuff out and show you, I don't have it completely waterproof the way I would before I, I buried this cache or placed this in the forest or where, what have you, however you go about hiding it. But there are a few options that I think are really good that I typically use for my caches. This one obviously is not being used for a cache because it's got stickers all over it. Uh, you don't have to have that. But this type of case, this Pelican style case, has a good O-ring style uh, rubber seal in it. They seal up really well and they're extremely durable. So this is one that I'd be comfortable in placing somewhere or even burying. Uh, so that is a good option and it's plastic, it's polymer, so it's not gonna rust over time. Another option that you could use is pretty simple and inexpensive. You can get these at most surplus stores, but this is just a regular military ammo can. Again, waterproof as well, but the container is a painted steel. So any compromise in the integrity of that paint and you're exposing that steel, over time it's gonna rust. So it may not be as durable as this, but it's definitely a lot less expensive. So uh, that's another option that you could use. And again, you're not always burying caches. So there's a lot of opportunity, especially in urban areas, uh, to where you can emplace a cache, kind of in plain sight, if you will, but you're, you're hiding it in a place that's, that's not commonly going to be found, uh, not a high traffic area. So that's another thing to consider. I also make kind of custom PVC tubes, black PVC tubes, uh, and this has been a really versatile system, versatile setup that I've used to emplace caches, especially the ones that I plan on burying. Uh, and what this is, is uh, this is Charlotte pipe. This is, I think, four inch PVC. Uh, and this you can scale up or down to what you're actually placing inside the cache. But this example is four inch PVC. I've got some uh, drain clean outs that I've glued onto this. And of course I put the drain plugs, which are just threaded. I put the drain plugs that are threaded in there. I can put stuff inside here and then I can seal that up, seal the threads, and then I've got a water tight container. All right. So, and again, this can be scaled. This particular one is four inch. So some of the stuff that I'm showing you won't fit in here, but I could use larger and larger PVC pipes. The, the system is still the same. Now, you can simply use a regular cap on one end and put your threaded drain on the other, but I choose to put it on both ends. And the reason being is you cannot just place a cache and leave it and forget about it. Um, you have to service these caches. You know, I would recommend at least once a year, go check on them to make sure everything's still good inside them. Things that you put in here may have expiration dates and that's something that you need to manage as a prepper. Uh, but another thing that I'll do is anything that I'm putting inside one of these or one of these is I'll vacuum seal that. If it's metal, I'll put some sort of a lubricant on that to prevent rust, some sort of corrosion protection. Vacuum seal that, place it inside the cache. And then what I do is I put oxygen absorbers or desiccant packets, whatever you plan to use, I'll put those on both ends of the cache before I seal it up. And then when I go to actually service these, all I have to do is open up both ends Typically what I'm gonna do is check the contents really quick, but if there's nothing in here that is uh, something that I'm worried about corrosion, I don't have to unpack the contents to simply unscrew both ends, 
replace the oxygen uh, replace the oxygen absorbers in both ends and put the caps back on. So if you have a lot of caches to service, it's just a time saver. Yeah, it's a little more expensive, but it's not that much more expensive. I'll, I'll take the convenience over that. Uh, if you plan on burying your cache a specific way, if you want to go vertically because you're worried about someone finding it, uh, you want to make the signature a little more reduced if they're using mine, uh, mine detectors, using metal detectors, it's also a mine detector, uh, then you may not have to do that. You may be able to bury it vertically, only put your drain on one side. But I put them on both. Make yours however you want to make these. These are, these are DIY things, okay? Sweet mother. It's like amateur hour over here. Why is a little tiny beef? <laughs> <laughs> you're you. Regardless of what size you make this pipe to suit your needs, one thing that I'll recommend you definitely carry with you is one of these drain wrenches, basically. This is a plastic version. You could probably get metal ones, uh, but to save weight, I chose a universal plastic one. Couple ways to think of these. Uh, you're gonna need it because you're actually gonna seal these threads when you close it down, especially if you're gonna bury it and make it watertight. So you're not gonna be able to get that off with your hand, all right? So you need some sort of a wrench to get that off, which is why I carry this. If you have multiple caches that you expect to be using this on, it's a good idea to add this to your baseline packing list for your bug out bag. If you only have one or two, then you can just bury this right alongside it, attach it to the container somehow so that it's there when you get there. What you don't want to do is get to your cache and you're relying on this to resupply or to uh, supplement your baseline kit and not have a way to get into this. So make sure you remember the wrench for that as well. So again, if you've got multiple, you don't want to buy multiples of these, just keep this in your bag, all right? If you've got just a couple, you can put this right alongside it in the cache, that way it's there when you need it. So, those are the kind of the containers, and then as far as what to put in the cache is probably one of the biggest questions I get when it comes to caching. I will say it, it depends on your plan, and it depends on what you think you're gonna need along your route to resupply. Now, what you don't wanna put on your back, you wanna put in a cache, and you wanna pre-stage that out in the area that you'll be going to. So with that said, think of your bug out bag, your baseline kit, and then think about what in that kit is durable and what's consumable, all right? A lot of things are durable. They're not something that you're gonna wear out on you know, a trip through the wilderness. It's just not gonna happen. But you need to think about things that are consumable, things that you consumed along your route, that you used, that need to be replaced or replenished. So the first type of cache that I wanna to talk to you about is just a basic resupply cache. I'm taking my bug out bag packing list and I'm looking at what's consumable and then I'm putting a replacement in there so that if I do consume all of that for any leg of my trip, I have it in the cache and can resupply, restock my baseline bag and continue to move, all right? So within, the baseline bug out kit, remember we set this up basically like we would any emergency kit. You know, we need to provide for fire, shelter, water, food, first aid, navigation, signal, tools, you know, that sort of thing. So within that context, the things that are consumable that are in my baseline packing list, if we're looking at fire, then obviously the things that are gonna be consumable that I'm gonna use up and not be able to replace without getting to this cache is, you know, it might be something as simple as your lighter ran out of fuel, so I've got an extra lighter inside my cache. I may have used up all of my beeswax candles, so I've got some additional beeswax candles in there. I may have used up all of my mini inferno, my emergency tender. So rather than be without for the rest of the time, I actually can just make it to my cache and I've got some inside there. So those are examples of consumable items that I would place inside a resupply cache for my fire kit. As far as my shelter, my poncho, my poncho liner, sleeping bags, all that, nothing's gonna happen to that. My ridge line is a dedicated 25 foot ridge line. I reuse that over and over again. What I might need to do is put some additional bank line in there. If I need additional cordage or I've used up cordage up to that point, this is a way to resupply it. Put the cordage in there, that would be considered a consumable. For water, for me personally, I'm using a Grail Geopress water filtration system, right? And the filters for these last 
a really long time, but I don't know what your water requirements are going to be or how long you've been out there. Uh, so it is a good idea since you can get replacement filters for these. It's a great idea to put a replacement filter inside your cache. So when you get to that, if your filter and this is worn out, then you've got an extra one and you're back in the game. If you're not using this type of system, you may put an extra filter for whatever system you're using inside here. You may put additional water purification tablets in here. Just make sure that you know what the expiration date is for those. And when you service these caches, make sure you replace that. But, you know, I just personally like to use this type of filter system. Throw an extra filter in the cache and you're pretty much good to go. Uh, that really extends your range, your ability to live out of this backpack and out of your system of caches. Uh, so that's fire shelter water for food. Again, for just a simple resupply on the move, I'm still going to go with these emergency rations. So I'm going to have some additional emergency rations in my cache. All right. And it's important to note that if I plan on getting three days up the road with this, and I say up the road, but it could be the trail, the forest, whatever. If I'm planning on getting three days away from the X, we'll say, within this bag with what's on my back, then I'm going to set these caches about every two days along my routes going in different directions um, because I don't want to run out completely before I get to the resupply cache. I want to get to the resupply cache before I actually run out. Uh, that kind of allows for contingencies a little better in my opinion. So about every two days I would set these up, but you can have some additional rations inside there. And again, you've extended your range and your ability to travel you know, longer distances and you're not carrying it on your back. You've got a lot of stuff pre-stage ahead where you're actually going to need it rather than carry it through the portion of your route that you don't, you're not going to need it. Uh, so food, I recommend doing that. Um, you're still trying to get from point A to point B. You're still not stopping to hunt and fish and trap. You know, that that's really goes against your goal of getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. So that is what I would do for food. Uh, as far as first aid, I think it's a good idea that if you're carrying a complete IFAC, like the GB2 IFAC, in your bug out bag, then you should also have an additional one inside a cache so that when you get to that location, if you, on the X, if you took an injury and you consumed the products, the, the items, the, the interventions that are inside this kit, you have additional ones that are not that far away at any given time and you can really extend your range because, you know, again, it's not always you know, that end of the world everywhere kind of thing. It's not an all or nothing thing. You may be in an area or a region where you can sustain an injury. And if you go 50 to 100 to 200 miles away, there may still be a hospital to get to. So think of it that way. Um, but you need to be able to get from the point of injury to that higher medical care. And you need to have products to do that. You don't necessarily need to carry a whole lot of medical gear, but you need to be able to handle it and then be able to resupply that and if you have an additional kit inside your cache when you get there you're going to be able to replenish those supplies and keep going as far as navigation some of the things that you might consider you know maybe some additional pencil leads for this maybe additional pencils they're not that expensive you could put that in there uh, you could put some more uh, waterproof paper in there another notebook if you need to might not be something that you think you're going to consume uh, but it is a consumable, so I just throw that out there for you. Uh, one thing that most people won't think about is a topo map only covers a certain area, okay? And depending on how long your route is to your alternate bugging location, you may eventually travel off of one map and be using another map for navigation. You've gone from one area that was covered by one map, now you need a second map, maybe even a third or a fourth map. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to carry five different maps when I only need one. So if you do some planning and some coordination, then you have your additional map that'll be covered with that area. When you get to that cache, you have your next map sheet inside there. You know, that way you're not carrying multiples of maps that you don't actually need. And then ounces equal pounds. So keep that in mind. So that's one thing that I would recommend that you take a look at for your navigation kit at a minimum is make sure you've got the next map that's going to cover the area you're going to be moving through in that particular cache. All right. For signal or communications, one thing that you're definitely going to consume, especially in your headlamp um, or your GPS, if you're using that as part of your plan, is batteries. So having additional batteries in here so that you can uh, replace the ones that you've consumed up to that point is just a great idea. Um, 
Another thing that you may have consumed, hopefully not. Uh, again, you're trying to avoid contact at all costs, but sometimes it happens and you have to maybe break contact and get out of there. And you can, you've used some ammunition to do that. So you can put ammunition inside a cache so that you can replenish your supplies when you get there. Another thing you may consider that would be consumable is things like your toilet paper, your soap, your toothpaste, your, uh, your insect repellent. Those things are a great thing to put inside of a cache. And me personally, I would probably put this inside the cache two days away rather than carry it for that initial two days running off the X. Uh, just because I'm not going to stop to do, I'm not going to stop to take a bath, you know, or bathe in a stream within that first couple of days because I'm trying to create distance from whatever that dangerous thing was, whatever that incident was. Uh, so maybe I don't carry it in my bug out bag, which makes it even lighter, but I have this in a cache. So, you know, a couple of days down the road, maybe four days up the road, then maybe that's where I, I have the chance to actually, you know, take the time to do some quick hygiene and I don't have to carry it all the time. Um, and that's a personal preference that's part of your plan. Maybe if it's me when I'm locating this cache, if it happens to be located next to a stream, I'll put some things like some camp soap in there. So I'm like, hey, if you have time when you get here, I've got a stream right here, I can do some quick hygiene and then I can move on and I don't have to carry that stuff through areas where it's not gonna be useful. Uh, so something to think about on that. And then I typically carry something like this, you know, just some duct tape. And then on the back of my knife, I usually have a larger sail needle for things like gear repair. Um, the chances of your gear failing within the first you know, couple of days is a little more slim if, you're, if you've been using and practicing with this gear and using it, you've identified problems like that. But some things happen. Um, so having a way to repair some gear, I can use the bank line, this needle that I've got taped on the back here. It's probably hard to see, but this sail needle and some duct tape that I can use for patches. I can use it for first aid applications as well. That's small enough and packable enough that I'd probably just keep it in my bug out bag just in case something happens along the way. But you know, if I do use it, that's a consumable. So maybe I put a more robust repair kit inside a cache, something to think about. That is kind of your basic resupply cache. Again, choosing a suitable container for the application you're using it for, whether you're hiding it or burying it. Um, and again, I want to remind you that if anything that you're going to bury, and honestly, anything that you put out there that's going to be out exposed to the elements, you're going to want to waterproof that. You're going to want to lubricate anything that could corrode. You're going to want to vacuum seal that, put it inside the more durable outer container and then put some oxygen absorbers or desiccant packets, what have you, in there. And then remember, you've got to service those things every year, at least once a year, you should be servicing these caches to make sure that they're gonna be readily available if and when you actually need those. As far as what goes in them, think about what is consumable in your bug out bag for your basic resupply, and then put your resupply things inside that cache. So that is a basic resupply cache and kind of my spin and my take on how to lighten the load on your back and not carry a bunch of stuff you don't need and pre-staging it in places where you might need it. What does it say right now? 22. 22 minutes? What the fuck? Yeah, I just started recording. All right. That's a good angle. Now, part of the thing that we need to always consider is when we're planning, you always need to think about the contingencies. And when you think contingencies, think about the worst possible case scenario. And for me, you know, one, one of those contingencies, one of those worst cases would include losing access to or forgetting or being liberated of my baseline bug out kit. But because I have a system of caches in place and I've thought about that contingency and plan for that contingency, I have a solution for that as well. Uh, so another type of resupply that I want you to think about, another type of cache that you should consider is a complete alternate bug out bag. And Granted, it's not going to be, and it's not always, I guess I shouldn't say not everybody can afford to purchase, you know, the top of the line gear, which I think you personally should purchase the best gear you can afford as long as it works. Uh, especially when you're coming down to, you know, your life and the life of your family depends on what's on your back. Uh, I think it's really important to get really good durable gear. It may not be in your budget or in your plan to be able to actually purchase a complete second bag that's just going to sit in a cache and you may never need it. And that's understandable. Uh, for me personally, 
I like uh, to set up a less expensive uh, but still adequate kit that I can fall back on in the event that I'm, I lose or I'm liberated somehow. I think you can use your imagination to figure out ways that you could be liberated of all your gear and be left with nothing. Uh, but I like to have a alternate bug out bag cache set up so that I'm not down and out with nothing. Uh, granted, it's not, you know, it's not my primary. Uh, my primary has all of the best gear that I can possibly afford in it. This one is less expensive, uh, but still going to be quite adequate. Uh, so understanding that not everybody can afford a complete another bug out bag, you know, this is a great solution that I think you'll like as well. We partnered with Alan Stanford from Stanford Outdoor Supply. He makes some incredible kits that are inexpensive, but they're still adequate. They're still pretty durable. Uh, again, it's not gonna be my primary, but it is something that I'm comfortable with putting in a cache and setting aside, maybe never needing it. Uh, and then if I do need it, you know, it's always there. That's the key. So what I like about the Boss Kits, the Bug Out Survival Supplements, the Boss Kits, is that these are set up in specific kits that are designed to provide for specific needs, which is the way that I teach you know, survival and preparedness. So these fit really well into my system. Uh, an example is the Fire Boss Bug Out Survival Supplement. And this has everything you need. It's an additional fire kit. This particular one is a 33 piece. It's got a lot of natural tinder. It's got additional uh, ignition sources. And then you have other things that he thinks about putting in there. You know, you've got an extra cutting tool, which is not the best knife on the planet, but you know, and I hate to say it, but it is much, much, much better than nothing. But you know, again, nothing should never be the bar we're trying to be above, but this is well beyond that. Uh, these are adequate kits and there's a lot of extras in there. So it's not just fire in there, but that is the fire kit. Then you have a shelter kit, which is gonna be, you know, pretty adequate for, for actually producing an actual usable shelter on the move. You know, you've got, uh, an extra tarp in there, some zip ties, another little saw, and again, it's not a silky, but it's a saw. Um, and some stakes, some additional things in here, so you can actually make a shelter. You're not gonna be down to nothing and relying on primitive techniques. So that's your fire kit, your shelter kit. Then as far as water, you've got a complete water gathering kit, and this has got some water purification tablets in it, uh, container, uh, hoses, it's got a ways to carry and store water. So this is a great way and an inexpensive way to put together that alternate kit and be able to still get water. So that is for water. Then for food, you've got basically a fishing and hunting kit, really small, really packable. So that's a really good alternative to put in that alternate bug out bag. Uh, and this particular one is a land nav kit because you're still gonna be able to navigate. Uh, so it has protractors, compass, uh, pace speeds, you know, something to record information with. So it's a really good supplement to your kit. And then of course, if everything's in these little kits and it's in a cache, I don't necessarily want to traipse around, if, you know, carrying uh, the cache container with me. So you can get something very small, very packable. It's just a replacement, lightweight pack. It all folds up inside here. Everything fits inside it, folded inside out, put everything in the bag. And now you have an easy way to carry your alternate bug out bag. So this would be an example of a complete alternate bug out bag that's inexpensive, durable enough, usable enough, and adequate enough that you could feel comfortable if you were down to just this and had to use it. Again, wouldn't be my primary, but that's what this bag is for. But it's definitely a great alternative. So those are the bug out survival supplements uh, that I think are, are definitely good things to invest in for you and your family. I'm made of sugar, as sugar melts in the water. You don't believe it, but you never had tang or Kool-Aid. No. Hunting and fishing and trapping are not part of my get from point A to point B plan. That's why I use emergency rations. My resupply caches have emergency rations in them. But that doesn't mean that at any point in the near future, I might not be in a situation where I want to be able to hunt. I want to be able to trap. I want to be able to fish. I just don't want to carry that on my back until I need those. So another cache that you can set up is a hunting, fishing, and trapping cache. And you put that in a location where it's actually going to be useful. Um, so when you're in your planning process and you're looking to put one of those together, then that is what it, you should consider. I like to keep in mind, I like to keep a 
a couple of different things. You need to think of actively hunting, actively fishing, passively fishing, and passively trapping. Uh, obviously the passive means are going to be working for you while you're doing other priorities. Uh, and then active or opportunistic hunting and fishing should be something that you equip and prepare yourself for as well. So I use, for my particular system, I use my own kind of personal micro fishing and trapping kit, uh, as well as a uh, M6 takedown series. This is the M6 rifle. This is basically a survival rifle that is very simple to use. Pop this pin out really quick, put it together. But this has actually got two different barrels on it and you can get them in different calibers. All of the rifle calibers are almost always coupled with the 410 shotgun. Uh, so it's a really useful rifle. And it has ammo storage back here. This particular one is chambered for 22 long rifle and of course 410 shotgun underneath. Really easy to switch back and forth between calibers. But these are kind of lightweight survival rifles that are very effective, very accurate. This particular one is uh, from TPS Arms. Uh, really like this rifle and I think it's a great addition to your overall preparedness kit. Be sad. So this particular one is the M6 Takedown series from TPS Arms, and this one is really nice. It's a really good addition to your kit as far as actively hunting um, or opportunistic hunting, as well as dispatching any animal that you might catch in a live trap. Uh, really handy to have, so that's something to consider for your own kit. Uh, and of course that comes with a choke tool that's pretty unique. Um, in that not only is it a choke tool for the 410 uh, on your shotgun, but it also accepts basically any driver bit, you know, so you can use a, a number of things. You could add a Phillips head, a flat head, uh, and a hex head, a couple of other bits in there, package that all together and keep it with you. And it's, you know, you can use that wrench for that as well. So really cool thing. Uh, so that's kind of for your opportunistic and your active hunting. But then most of the time, because I have so much other things to do, I'm going to be relying on passive means of doing that. So when you think of passive, think of passive land-based and passive water-based, and it really depends on what you're going for. My kit kind of starts with a couple of large steel rat traps. These are also effective for small game like squirrels. Uh, and speaking of squirrels, you know, they have a couple of holes in those that you can actually use to put these right up against the tree. And of course this is, this is you know, a post event kind of thing. This isn't something you do for everyday trapping. It's probably not legal, probably not any more legal than, than primitive traps are. So keep that in mind. But just, you know, this is examples of ways you can procure feud. But because these can be nailed up against the tree, I throw a handful of galvanized roofing nails in there just to use for that, to make that technique a little easier. You could also tie or wire them up if you wanted. But I've got my steel rat traps and of course everything in the wild loves peanut butter. Uh, so I just carry a pack of this particular one's maple almond butter. So I might actually eat this later uh, and put some regular peanut butter in here. But this is what you use for bait for this type of trap. All right. And you can use it for a number of other things as well. So that's kind of my first go to. And then of course using snares. You all probably know that I like the Thompson Survival Snare Kits. I carry three of those in here. Um, but the Survival Snare Kit comes with a large snare, a small snare, and some wire to actually wire those up to an anchor. Uh, and I carry three total of those kits in this micro trapping kit because two is one and one is none. Ten or more is dinner for sure. You never want to rely on you know, one to two traps to provide sustenance for you and your family. You want to put out at least 10 traps. Uh, so I try to carry enough traps pre-made that I can quickly get out there wherever I'm at. Uh, and that includes three survival snare kits. I also carry a little bit of additional snare wire. This is some heavy gauge snare wire uh, that I get from Wazoo Survival Gear. It comes in these small tubes, really packable. You can put these in caches. You can put them everywhere put them in your micro trapping kit. You've got some additional snare wire. I think each one of these tubes is 15 feet. I usually figure 
three to five feet, uh, three to five feet per snare, so I can get you know a handful of snares per tube um, in there. But those are just additional. And that's kind of my my passive land based. And then when I start looking at you know my passive water based, which are fish traps basically, then you need kind of fishing tackle to go with that. Uh, but that starts with for me, it starts with these fishing yo-yos. I think these are one of the most handy water based traps that are on the market today uh, and I think that they're small lightweight and affordable and they're really easy to put inside a kit and you can set these up in a series along a bank or any waterway had that coming to me that's why you carry extra because you lose one so those are really easy to set you put your fishing tackle on the end of it whenever the animal or the fish actually takes the bait it releases that trigger and it holds tension on them in the water to keep that hook from coming out until you come and retrieve the fish. So setting up a handful of these is really quick and they're really, really effective. And of course you need to put some sort of tackle on those. So my fishing tackle kind of fits inside of an Altoids tin. Uh, the stuff that I find particularly useful for the methods that I'm using. Uh, one of the most effective means that I'm going to use to procure fish passively is a retrievable trot line or a bank line. So I keep additional bank line in there. This is about 100 feet of number 36 and about 50 feet of, I believe this one's number 12. It's a thinner bank line. So when I'm making trot lines or making bank lines, bank lines is this, trot lines use both. And then I need to kind of rig those. So this particular bag, I've got some large hooks because when I'm setting a trot line or a bank line, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fishing usually for catfish. Um, so I want kind of heavier duty, uh, larger hooks for that. And I want some large swivels so that as the fish are getting trapped on that uh, trot line or that bank line, then it can swivel rather than bind up and really get tangled. So uh, swivels and I've got the largest weight I can get in there. Keep in mind that in a lot of currents, this isn't gonna be heavy enough, but it gives you a good place to start. Uh, but that's all in that kit if I wanted to set a bank or a trot line, then that's what I need out of there. Then for kind of medium sized fish and smaller fish, I've got some snelled hooks that I can rig directly to my fishing yo-yos and additional swivels, some smaller swivels and a variety of split shot sinkers that I can use. And that gets everything set up, you know, so that the types of fishing I plan to do, that's what I put in these kits. You know, you can, you only, you can get fishing kits on the market, but they're not typically as useful as you might think. Uh, you just gotta look at all the components and find out if you know how to use all of that stuff. And that's true for everything. Uh, I carry a small spool that already has some 25 pound test fishing line on it. And this is useful as a hand reel if I'm actively fishing. Um, but I also carry some, some braided fishing line. And this is also in tubes. I get this from Wazoo as well, the same place that I get the snare wire, the additional snare wire. This is some additional fishing line that fits really well inside the tin. And then of course, depending on the type of fishing you're doing, a lightweight float is always handy, even though you can produce these in the wild, it's one less thing you have to worry about. Uh, and then kind of a variety of lures. Uh, it's not always easy to find bait when you're out there. So sometimes you don't need to. Fish are attracted for, to things that look different in the water. So you may just need a handful, a variety of colors, different shapes. That may be all you need. A small spoon is all you really need to catch attention sometimes and you can catch fish on that. But that gives you some lure choices. If you're actually successful in catching fish, another thing that I like to keep in my micro fishing and trapping kit is some heavy duty foil. This foil I get from Wazoo Survival Gear. It's, uh, it's extremely thick foil and it's actually, I've used it to make an improvised container with. Uh, but the reason I carry this is when I'm uh, expecting to catch fish, especially the smaller pan fish, uh, I can stew that in a pot of course and make a soup. Uh, but this gives me some other options for cooking that fish. Uh, so that is a good addition. And you know, I could also tear the corner off of this because it's shiny and I could make an improvised lure with that. Uh, but you know, I've got another, enough other lure options in here that I'm less worried about using for that, but you could uh, for sure. And then 
last but not least another kind of opportunistic and possibly active means you could use uh, for procuring food is is a simple frog or a fish spear all right something that's really durable that's not going to break on you you know as you're using it uh, i like this particular one uh, it's nice and flat but it is a hardened steel it's hardened at the tip and it's sharp and it's extremely sharp but this is designed to sort of offset it's bendable enough still to where you can offset it and then lash that to a pole and use that for fish or frogs because life kind of begins and ends there on the water's edge right um, your land-based animals still go to the water's edge because that's their water resource and the animals that are in the water obviously come up to the edge because they can feed up there on bugs uh, and it's just a really great place to find food. Uh, so the water's edge is where it's at, and I think the best way to really actively or opportunistically hunt and fish is right there on the water's edge. So I think it's one of the most important things in this microfishing and trapping kit as far as active and opportunistic hunting and fishing. Uh, and it, it can be used for both. Uh, so that's a really good piece of kit that I think should be included in there. And Again, this is not something I keep inside my bug out bag because it's not something I plan on doing while moving from point A to point B. I'm relying on emergency rations, but when I get to an area that this may be useful, then I may be there for a while, then I want this in a cache or I want this, of course, in my alternate bug in location because once I get there, I'm not going to subsist on emergency rations forever. I've got food supplies there, but I'm always going to be trying to supplement with animals and fish that I'm getting in the moment, in that day so that I don't have to tap into my food storage and then my food storage is gonna last that much longer. And all this micro fishing and trapping kit fits inside this Badger Claw Big Boar kit bag. This particular one is green. He makes those specifically for me, uh, but those will be available. Everything fits inside there. It's a wax canvas, really durable, really well made. And that along with my takedown rifle, and you've got a pretty good combination for really keeping you and your family fed in the long run.